Hello and welcome to Miss Hannah Loves Grammar. In this video we'll be concentrating on the major ideas and themes as conveyed through the language and structure of Thomas Hardy's poem At an Inn. For more interesting ideas about Hardy the man, click on my video The Ruin Maid, where I've outlined a few key ideas. I'm going to go through this poem stanza by stanza, but I think the immediate thing you get from the title is it sets the action of the poem in a pub. And it centres us on the location as a very important part of the story it tells. So here goes. When we as strangers sought their catering care, veiled smiles bespoke their thoughts of what we were. They warmed us as they opined us more than friends, that we had all resigned for love's dear ends. Immediately we're struck that these two walk into a pub. And the alliteration of strangers sought and catering care, it's the comfort of this location. People in this pub do not know who they are, but they're interested in what they could be. Throughout this stanza are layers of euphemism. There are veiled smiles. It suggests there's something hidden beneath the smiles. And it's as if people have judged that these two are a couple. So our speaker feels that Others in this pub have assumed they are together. He's with a woman, I would assume, and he's presuming that the others around them think they are a couple. Now, the verbs opined and then later what rhymes with it, resigned in this stanza, suggests there's a speculation regarding these two as married. I think the, the word warmed as well. They warmed as they opined us more than friends. The fact our speaker chooses to concentrate and fixate on the fact that others are judging them as a couple perhaps suggests his own preoccupation with what they could be rather than what they are. So it's clearly, you know, he hopes they are something, otherwise he probably wouldn't comment on it or fixate on it. And that swift sympathy with living love, which quicks the world, Maybe the spheres above made them our ministers, moved them to say, Ah, God, that bliss like theirs would flush our day. Once more, in the second stanza, we meet a lot of alliteration with swift sympathy and living love. And it emphasises what love looks like to the others in the inn. They look like they had a young love's dream. I like the third line of the second stanza on line 11, which says, which quicks the world, maybe. You know, the idea that love makes your world run faster. It's just such an exciting time when you're in love. This is all as if hearing the views of others in this pub. But the pub dwellers aren't questioning in the way the speaker is. As we move into, maybe the spheres above made them our ministers. This is the speaker thinking, are oh, supernatural forces longing for us to be together? Now, Hardy was not a religious man. In fact, he was famously agnostic. So perhaps here he's trying to work out how have they been brought together? Or at least his speaker is. The fact that the speaker quotes the people in the pub in the last two lines of this stanza is pretty ironic. So the pub dwellers are thinking, oh, I wish we could be as happy as they look. Oh, God, that bliss like theirs would flush our day. So they seek what our speaker and his companion seem to have. But it's once more dramatic irony because they are not together. So we seem to go round in a loop once more. We're going back to the start. They look like they're together but they're not they are together but they're not i just want to remind us that in victorian society it would have been seen as inappropriate for a man to go for a drink with a woman if he wasn't married to her so we do dig deeper as to well how are they together if they're not together stanza three does reveal for us what's going on and we were left alone as love's own pair yet never the love light shone between us there but that which chilled the breath of afternoon and palsied unto death, the pan flies tune. <sighs> this is the grand reveal. It stands as one and two with the trailer. Unfortunately, 
This is a tragic stanza. There's no alliteration for a start, which is a shift from earlier stanzas. It's painful and it's chilling. They were left alone. The capitalization of love there in the second line of the third stanza ignites the fact that they looked like they were love's pair and here they were together alone. Yet never the love light shone. The reality of their love is revealed to us. There was no chemistry between them. And it's quite dramatic, I think. The, the irony of that reveal at this point in the poem has really built them up as something more because other people presumed so. If anything, there's some pretty chilling facts that come to the fore as well. Not only did no love light shine, but also but that which chilled the breath of afternoon. It's almost as if they are cold in their actual intentions to each other when they're together. The word palsied suggests that this has paralysed their relationship and as the afternoon unwinds, it's like they get closer to the death of their relationship. And it's quite depressing. It's almost as if it's as futile, their relationship. The plan flies tune, it's the, the pain flies tune, I should say. Pain and pain, it sounds, it's a homophone, it sounds like pain that you'd feel, but actually it's talking about a fly. It's as futile as a fly flying into the window pane. This relationship seemed to have such promise for us as the reader, yet as we dig deeper, there's no hope. The kiss their zeal foretold and now deemed come, came not. Within his hold, love lingered numb. Why cast he on our port a blue not ours? Why shaped us for his sport in after hours? So this is getting to the end of the night now. And the pub dwellers are looking at this couple and they're thinking, oh, are they gonna kiss? Oh, be cute. Um, the people at the inn are expecting them to do that. And it's this whole business of their zeal foretold they being the pub dwellers. I also presume the speaker had hoped that at some point. So as the speaker and his companion had to, had to leave, they do not kiss each other. And note, at this point in our stanza, it shifts. There's a change to the third person narrative. It feels more powerful, almost as if our speaker is questioning God a god he maybe doesn't believe in. Why cast he on our port a bloom not ours? Why shaped us for his sport in after hours? As if that weren't enough, the futility of hope for this love is just cast down a little bit further by the alliteration of love lingered numb. And to end your alliteration with a word like numb, it silences any idea of hope. I think there's quite a judgmental, angry speaker in this stanza. Why cast he on our port a bloom, not ours? He's judging a God that seems brutal. But our speaker seems really frustrated. Why would others or God suggest that our love could work if it can't? Why is this the case? I love the learned reference to King Lear here, actually. Uh, in King Lear, he... He divides his kingdom and he's, he makes a mistake of judgment. And, it, and he says, as flies to wanton boys, we are to the gods. They kill us for their sport. Here it is. Why shaped us for his sport in after hours? So there it's, you know, we're just, we're just a plaything for God. But once more, love in this time was shaped by society's conventions. So is there something deeper that stops them and hinders them that comes our question as readers? But also in after hours, it implies there's something illicit here. Maybe they shouldn't actually be together for other grounds that we are not aware of as readers. As we seemed, we were not that day afar. And now we seem not, but we aching are. O severing sea and land, O laws of man, ere death once let us stand, as we stood then. So in that final stanza, time has intensified. And more than anything, it's that day again. He's revisiting that day. It's as if in this stanza, it, it feels quite complicated. 
But now they are not together. Perhaps they wish to have been together. They look back on that moment as a turning point. The alliteration of aching R, severing C, accentuates the divisions between these two. There's a geographical severing between the sea and the land, and also just the judgments of others, the laws of men suggests what their chances are of being together. It also suggests once more the importance of time, the importance of distance between then and now and where that leaves them. I also just think by the sentiment at the last line, ere death once let us stand as we once stood then. It's a sentiment shared by Tennyson, a great writer, who says better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. There's a sort of disappointment, I think, tinged with sadness for us, but they are not together. There doesn't seem so much hope and joy. There's a frustration that they never were. Perhaps Hardy uses this poem to ignite questions about the way Victorian society critiques. It critiques people without knowing them. It makes superficial judgments. Yet our speaker seems angry and bitter and full of resentment about what could have been. Maybe they are someone who's caught in a loop of their own paranoia. Or is it something more harrowing than that still? The question is left unanswered. I think we feel quite unresolved by the end of this poem. The use of exclamation marks throughout this poem, and even a speech mark in the second stanza, ignites for us this compelling emotive streak. Emotive yet resigned to its fate, uh, with a society that has its set rules and regulations. Perhaps this is a poem of love that could have been, but was not allowed to flourish. A gloom not ours after all. Hardy once more strikes a chord with us. His gloomy style, his brutalist approach to hitting the nerve is shown through a speaker that's frustrated and resents what it is rather than what it could have been.